That's right. It is orange and blue today. It is Cecil Lammy and Andrew Mason talking Denver Broncos. And Mace, I know, I know, it's quarterback, it's quarterback, it's quarterback. But what if it's not quarterback at number 12 overall? And what, in fact, if it is cornerback for the Broncos in the first round? Well, I'm not sure how well it's going to be received by a lot of people in Broncos country. There are are some reasons to take corner however when you look at the roster and look at where the holes are if you don't pick qb i think there are some defensible spots both philosophically and and roster wise i'm not sure corner is among them at the present time right and we talk about you know key positions we know that cornerback is such a key position but after the move for riley moss this is why you and I want him to play more last year. Like he, mm-hmm. he's coming in pretty fresh, pretty green, if you will. And it's like you make that move for Riley Moss and then you draft another cornerback at 12. We're seeing some mock drafts, Terry and Arnold, uh, for example, being mocked to the Broncos in some drafts. And you can see my cornerback preview. It's denversports.com. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me, Mace. Yeah. And the thing is, like, what sort of spurred this discussion is of course Mel Kuyper Jr., kind of the you know one of the OGs of draft um, analysis, still with ESPN. Mel Kuyper Jr. has uh, Quinion Mitchell, the corner from the University of Toledo, mocked to the Denver Broncos at number twelve. And Mitchell, hey, there's some special attributes to him: four three three speed, for example. He's got range. He's got, he's got length. He's he got, plays like uh, a wide receiver. Yes, I mean honestly, like you look at the physical skill set. Um, I know people that would argue, okay, why isn't he on offense with that kind of skill set? Why is he playing corner? But the thing about the thing about that is, A, we are in an era where we're seeing more zone coverage than ever. We're seeing shell concepts all over the place. The Broncos are a zone-based team. So in terms of your overall roster building, is this the spot where you want to invest another first round pick? You haven't had a first round pick since 2021 and you're going to go back to corner. And you mentioned Riley Moss. Um, They traded up to get Riley Moss. He had his rookie season waylaid by a training camp injury, put him behind the eight ball. General manager, George Payton on record as saying that he sees Riley Moss as a starter in this league. So in terms of team building or roster building, getting everything up to a a better level, I don't think corner is the wise play at number 12 here if you don't go QB. I think if you're talking about areas that really can help the, the roster, you're talking about defensive line, you're talking about edge rusher, and even though you can argue with the control, the contract value, maybe it's not proper position value, but tight end, if Brock Bowers is there, that is also viable at number 12 to me rather than corner. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mace, but Daniel Jeremiah has always put out what he believes you need an elite level mm-hmm. talent at those positions and you need it at quarterback. Obviously it's a conversation we have on a daily basis on this mm-hmm. show and everyone stay tuned for OBT two tonight, YouTube exclusive 7 PM mountain time. Eric Edholm from NFL.com joins us. It's a fantastic conversation about these quarterbacks. So we got plenty of quarterback conversation, but when I look at you know, where you need the elite tiers and it's pass rusher and it's cornerback and it's, you know, left tackle and it's quarterback well, they have the elite talent at corner. They do not have it. As much as we appreciate the edge guys, when we talked about Latu Latu yesterday, like that makes more sense if you're not going to mock a quarterback to the Denver Broncos at 12. Go with an edge rusher versus Latu, whoever you want. Yeah, those two guys who had the potential to be stud alpha edges you've got game like, wreckers right like you've got good pieces i mean uh, jonathan cooper I'll, I'll, i feel like i'm going to use the phrase starter in this league is george payton jonathan cooper's a starter in this league all right baron browning is a starter quality player these two are starter quality players as the number two edge mm-hmm. not the number one you could argue because of his pass rush skills, which certainly tower over his abilities to set the edge against the run, 
You could say that at least in part of his game, Nick Benito is a starting caliber edge rusher. Sure. But not because Benito doesn't have the run game element to him really at a high level, he's a number two. You don't have the number one. I mean, I, I know I've said this before, and I, people are probably sick of hearing this, but it's like a pitching rotation in baseball where your number one starter is more like a, a number two. You don't have the ace. So you got two that's your one, but then you get to your second, third, and fourth starters, and they're all like number two and maybe number three. So you're above average at these other spots, two, three, four, in the edge rotation, but the person who's your number one is more like a number two. And that's why you can say, all right, we going and trying to find that alpha in the room at edge, that is a defensible pick, even if you choose not to address QB in round one. And I yeah, I, I completely get that if they do that. It's Russian cover in this yeah. league. Like, and I go back to Super Bowl Fifty. God, that seems like forever ago because it kind of yes. was. In NFL terms, it kind of was. But I, I, you know, your backup pass rushers were a first round pick and Shaq Barrett. You know, and I, mm-hmm. I, I could say not Shane the injuries and everything but Shaq Barrett certainly as a reserve was better than anything the Broncos have right now as a starter so you need that alpha dog and your other guys are more than fine your other guys are exciting but they're more of that second tier type of pass rusher if you can get that stud you get it there and you already have your stud corner and obviously these mocks have the Broncos stay and put okay well you've you're keeping Pat Sertan then and if you have two stud corners but you're not getting the rush kind of takes the power away from them yeah, and the Broncos last year, they were 30th in pass rush win rate, according to ESPN analytics. I mean, that's not good. Now, some of that comes from the interior of the defensive line, which is another area I think the Broncos do need to upgrade. The question is, like, with pass rushing interior defensive linemen, are you looking at the value being there at number 12 compared to where it is at edge this year? Um right. And also, let's face it, uh, pass rushing interior defensive linemen, they're hard to find. You know, that's why Aaron Donald was so valuable. You could say probably the most important element of the Rams defense for the last decade. Because Aaron Donald was a unicorn, right? Mm -hmm. Absolute stud. Pass rushers of his ilk on the interior don't come along very often. That's why you know you you talk about the no fly zone in Super Bowl Fifty. I mean, yeah, that was a long time ago. One of the things that made it work was interior defensive line. You had Malik Jackson, and Derek Wolf were working together, mm-hmm. and they together they were a good interior pass rushing duo. The Broncos haven't had anything like that since then. They brought right. back Derek Wolf. He played four more seasons, but. They missed Malik Jackson. They meet. They missed the two of them working together. It, it didn't have the same punch in the years that followed in this. The Broncos declined. Yeah, the same panache, if you will. And I've always said, and Derek and both Vaughn have admitted to this, like Derek gave up some of his numbers so that Vaughn could get his, and they work together well. So it's a combination of players mm-hmm. up front that create a rush and create duress. We know that the key to this league is putting that other guy's quarterback, no matter how great he is, under pressure you can pressure with four gives you much greater outcome because you're able to drop more players into coverage in this pass happy Mm -hmm. league that's how you win it is and and the thing is like you can overcome right you 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 can if you've got uh issues in the secondary you can overcome that if you've got the the pass rush um and I would argue that's what that's the more important that's the more important thing right now in terms of the Broncos. If you're going to actually have an improved outcome for this defense, you've got to improve the pass rush first. And, and I, I feel like the run defense, Dave, I like the move of Malcolm Roach there, having him on the interior, working in base. I, I like a base defensive line of you know of Zach Allen. DJ Jones, Malcolm Roach. I feel like that'll help DJ Jones, and hopefully DJ Knock on Wood can stay healthy. It, that that actually is a defensive line that I think maybe can avoid some of the same pitfalls that we saw last year. You know, if DJ's healthy, 
Roach is in there, good run stuffer. I think you have something that's promising that you can that you can work with against yeah. the run. So I do I, I do think the Broncos to start with are going to be better against the run. I'd still love it if Fabian Lovett was there in round four. Give me another real stud run defender on the interior. But I like that. But then you get in the pass rush. You gotta you gotta find something here. I mean, uh, I'll say this for the Broncos, and this is where to use Zach Allen's phrase, uh, necessary changes, right, are being made. I don't think he was talking about just QB. I mean, we all kind no. of refer to that because that's yes. the primary thing. But I right. think he's talking about he's talking about the defense as well. I think he's talking about Malcolm Roche coming in, and I think uh, at linebacker, and that's where it gets interesting because you are taking out Josie Jewell better against the run, inserting Cody Barton, whose strength is in dropping into coverage. Yes. Not a plus player against the run, but he can drop into coverage. What the Broncos are saying is they feel like they're going to improve the outcome against the run by hat, by inserting Roach in there, putting less stress on the inside backers and then letting things flow from there. And if you, if they, feel like they've done that then it goes to shoring up the pass rush i do think they're going to add an edge at some point in the draft season I, yes it's a question of whether you're adding early or not if you don't go qb i think edge is the spot to go to yeah go edge and go late and get our guy from charlotte that i can pronounce, can't pronounce his name watch what they do not what they say yobi? and we will see yobi mm-hmm. gotta get him yobi. we will see what they do when we get to the NFL draft. And I'll say this also what they do or haven't done Mace is very mm. important in the conversation. Look at how DJ Jones has been treated this off season, a player that was easily a candidate for some sort of restructure or even release. Like they like him to keep him around and to keep his salary at a, at a high level. And just a note to Broncos fans who maybe don't like what they've seen. We have not seen the best of DJ Jones. He's better than what he's shown during his time with the Denver Broncos. I still believe that if healthy, he can be an impact player. And one of his best assets is how he does get interior pressure. So I'd like yeah. to see that. When healthy is kind of the, the big thing because players of that body type, unfortunately, don't age very well. Right. So that's the real concern. Can you ring a good year out of DJ Jones? But it would be a year, right? Because it's the last year's contract. So the only type of restructure or ability to kind of knock down his cap figure for 2024 they could have done would have been adding a year onto the deal. And they chose not to do that. So he's he's in a contract year. And so that, I think, is another reason why you take a look at a Fabian Lovett as you get to round three, round four, because you kind of need a plan beyond DJ Jones, I think, as we get into the 2025 season and making sure things are shored up are short up on the interior. Yeah, and a cornerback late are all the guys that they've been looking at. And again, in DenverSports.com, mm-hmm. you check out my cornerback uh, you know, rankings and kind of a breakdown of this class. And it seems like every one of the corners that they brought in for top 30 visits are late round guys, potentially priority for agents. And hey, you can use your visits however you want. But when you bring in a David White at a wide receiver, it's like, okay, well, that's an undrafted, you know, late round type of guy. So we'll see even, um, you know, you know, these other corners, the Nebraska kid, I can't remember his name right now, that they brought in for a visit. Mm-hmm. Like all of these players are late round prospects at the corner position. So I think they're going to add one, Mace, but it's going to be on day three. Now, that being said, they did interview Terry and Arnold at the NFL draft or NFL combine. Combine, me. yep. And Jim Leonard – uh, who is your past game coordinator on the defensive side, was at Cooper DeGene's uh, workout because, of course, he did it later because he was coming off the injury. It's when he ran the 40. So there mm-hmm. has been at least due diligence there, and you know that Jim Leonard knows somebody like Cooper DeGene quite well from his Big Ten days at Wisconsin and then mm-hmm. his past year working on Illinois staff as well under Brett Bielema. So that – that that I thought was notable that they had Jimmy Leonard out there for the special workout for Cooper DeGene. Now, part of it is I think the Broncos are they're covering all their bases here, making sure that they have all the knowledge that they can possibly have. But I thought that was interesting. Mm, you want me to be kitschy, Mace? Kitschy? You? Yes. Never. Yeah. No. I know. <laughs> you know what I call Jim Leonard? What? 
future head coach of the Denver Broncos. Whoa! <laughs> I was going to say future DC, but then everyone's going to go back to, oh, you hate just Vance Joseph. Like, no, Jim Leonard is so damn special. We haven't even done our full show on Jim Leonard. Wait till people get a, a, a nose on that. But, like, Jim Leonard's influence is, is there. And as he climbs the ladder in the coaching ranks, I think his influence will continue to grow. Yes, I think so as well. This was low-key. Jimmy Leonard was the biggest addition for the Broncos so far this offseason. Obviously, if they go QB in the draft, that changes it. Who you're talking about is the biggest addition. But I think actually legitimately, legitimately we can say beyond QB, mm-hmm. the most important addition to the Broncos this offseason is Jim Leonard. Very telling. He's not just the defensive pa- get backs coach. They gave him that title coordinator, pass game coordinator on there as he makes his return to the NFL on the coaching side. Of course, he played for a long time, including a stop with the Broncos and also a brief stop with Sean Payton trying to make the New Orleans Saints in 2013. Didn't make the roster, but clearly made an impression on Sean Payton to bring him to, to, to bring him in. And actually Sean Payton wanted him last year as well. But after he moved on from the University of Wisconsin, or I should say they moved on from him because he was the interim head coach and they chose to hire Luke Fickle. He took the most of the offseason to uh, have, you know, have a hip replacement and deal with that before he got back into coaching. But yeah, he's, you know, now, now the Broncos got a guy that they wanted on the staff. And um, you you, you do wonder what the impact is for for Vance Joseph as well, and mm-hmm. um, you know I think uh, I think Sean Payton, as he as he puts together his staff, after having been in Denver a year, I think he's less concerned with trying to massage egos and more concerned with just having the best coaches that he can find, right in there. And that's why you see Jim Leonard around, even though is that is it a threat to Vance Joseph? Yeah, potentially. I mean, you could argue Jim Leonard was the best defensive coordinator in college football for a six year stretch. Yep. With, you know, he had he had Wisconsin at or near the top of the defensive rankings in FBS year after year. The Green Bay Packers, you know, sniffed around him, were interested in him. On the multiple occasions, uh, just a huge get for the Broncos and somebody who I think now, as college football has shifted now dramatically, yes, I think now he's a better fit in the NFL. I think for a while, Jim thought he was a better fit in the college ranks, which is one reason why he stayed at Wisconsin. Alma mater, that is his alma mater, and he grew up in the state, so it was a, a job and a place that was very near and dear to his heart. Um but as the landscape changed, and even as Wisconsin's football landscape changed, I think, uh, think he, he, he decided to, to give the pros a look and decided that's probably where his future lies. And I think, I agree with you, I think he is a future head coach in the NFL. I'm not going to be as bold as, say, Denver Broncos. I just think he's, he's a future head coach in this league. Hey, Sean Payton wins the Super Bowl, steps down, Jim Leonard takes over, right? Mm-hmm. Sounds good, right? We can dream. Yeah. We can't. Oh man, that was well. First of all, they're winning a Super Bowl, which I think right now <laughs> to a lot of Broncos country seems like a dream. Okay, well, if you're going to win a Super Bowl, what do you have to do here in the draft? You got to start by finding the quarterback. Which, <laughs> <laughs> you got to crush it. Validate this whole conversation, at least the the first topic of this conversation. Right, right. Uh, I will say this, and you got me thinking about former Broncos who dabbled with the Saints. It's mm-hmm. a longer list than you think. We remember Champ. Went down there for a cup of coffee. Uh, remember Orlando went down there for a couple of a cup of coffee. I don't even. I don't think he made the. I think he might have retired before he ever played. Somebody on eBay had an Orlando Franklin jersey for sale, a game used one. It was from the preseason, I believe, or even training camp, because Orlando told me he's like, I never played for him, he's, but he went down there. Um, and then Big Al, Alfred Williams, uh, also had a cup of coffee with New Orleans before he ended up retiring. So. You know, there's there's a Broncos Saints connection more than just Sean Payton hiring everybody from New Orleans. Well, the other thing also, I mean, and this is sort of an infamous connection. The Ted Gregory, 1988 first round pick, famously 
the Broncos had the wrong height on him and realized it when Dan Reeves was there to introduce Ted Gregory to the Denver area media after drafting him and realized that he was taller than Ted Gregory, which was like, <laughs> whoa. I mean, things that would not happen today, mm-hmm. but could happen in 1988, having the wrong measurement on your first round pick. And so they end up trading Ted Gregory later on that season to uh, to the New Orleans Saints. Um Trying to think of other other Broncos Saints connections. That's actually a really uh, a really really interesting one. I mean, it seems like they're the the connections are coming fast and furious now. I mean, you know, you've got a former Broncos defensive coordinator, of course, who's the head coach down there. You have a Kubiak on the staff. Clint Kubiak is uh, right. New Orleans Saints offensive coordinator and uh, replacing Pete Carmichael, who's now on the Broncos staff. <laughs> oh. Gosh, it's yeah. the, the it's pretty wild, like how how the connections are and how it's kind of it's kind of become. It, we talk about everyone coming from New Orleans to Denver, but it's kind of working the other way with people that have a Broncos background going to New Orleans too. Right, it's the circle of life, the coaching circle and the player circle in the NFL. Uh, Orange and blue today. Chances as we wrap up the show, percentage that they take a corner. You know me and quarterback, I'm saying 95%. So corner is obviously 0%, half a percent. Anything is possible. What's your percentage, Mace? 7%. It's healthy. It's a healthier number. Yeah, well, you know me. I'm, I hate it a little more than you. you. You tend to go toward absolutes or closer to absolutes than I do. So... Had the Broncos win a Super Bowl. Had Vance Joseph fired last year, so you know, I'm emotional games. and opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> that show, I'll st- I, I will never forget when I when I actually and I listened to it. Um, You're driving back from uh, that game. Yes, driving back to Tampa, where near Tampa, where my parents live, after the seventy twenty debacle. And believe me, even though you're just covering it. Four and a half hours and 70 points gives you a lot to think about as you're replaying the game in your mind and, you know, what you're what you're going to what you're going to do content wise. Because like you're you're thinking like, OK, what comes next for this team? You know, what are we going to be chronicling here? And I listen to you and like I swear it was 10 times in the first 10 minutes. You said Vance, every time you said Vance Joseph, he's going to be fired and he's going to be fired and he's going to be fired. <laughs> um, One day I will be right. And then I can say I was right. Uh, okay, so if they do move on from Vance Joseph at some point, I guess we should get clips up and say, yeah, just a, a year and a half late. I was later. only like two years early or whatever. So yeah, you yeah. know, but that it's that's an interesting dynamic that um, I don't think is on a lot of radars right now. Is that look if you're a coordinator, you've got uh, you, you've got a shorter leash than a head coach does, For sure. especially a head coach like Sean Payton. So the Broncos defense has to show palpable improvement here in 2024, or I do think at the end of the season, they're making a change at defensive coordinator. I, I absolutely think that's that it's a low key hot seat situation for Vance Joseph going into 2024. Yep. And in order to do that, Mace, to make that biggest impact or that biggest leap defensively, you get a pass rusher, not a corner at 12. Mm, Yes. You get somebody who helps. And then, and also then you give Riley Moss a chance. Like if you, you, George Payton gets up there and says, he believes Riley Moss is a starter in this league. Sean Payton has talked about Riley Moss. Um, Okay. Then you actually have to give him a shot. And here's another thing. If you're going to build this roster, whether you trade up, trade down, whatever, if you're going to build this roster, you actually at some point have to show some faith in players you picked in reasonably high draft spots and put them out there and see if they're going to swim. And I think this year, it's, part of it is finding out what Riley Moss can do. Hmm. Is he is he ready for – look, and you're not asking him to be CB1. You're asking him to be CB2. I think you've got a great answer at the slot corner in Jake Juan McMillan. But you got to find out about Riley Moss. You trade up for him. You say you see him as a starter. Put your money where your mouth is. 
traded valuable assets for him. So let him play. Yeah. Let him play. Mm-hmm. See if the kid can do it. That is a wrap for today's program. It is Orange and Blue today. He's Andrew Mason. I am Cecil Lammy. You follow Mace on all the socials at Mace Denver. But first, before we're out of here, how do the folks help us out on YouTube, Mace? Real simple. Like. Comment. Share. Subscribe. Hit that notification bell. So that you never Never miss a vid. That's right. OBT is a BFD. He's Mace. I'm Cease. We are orange and blue today. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned and stay frosty.